let's make 700 horsepower on the cheap. Cheapish. All right, it's expensive, but we're gonna cut some corners where we shouldn't to save some money for science. The hackery's about to begin. Trashed, trashed, trashed. Screw that up completely. Got it cross-threaded before I've even got threads in it. That's certainly broken. You drop it first. You use JBL to fix the mistakes you made. Oh, that's a dent. Wrong hole. It almost looks like a crack. This is too far. Yep. Let's pick up where we left off. Welcome to the channel. I'm Jamin, not Burt Kreischer, and I'm gonna go put my shirt back on. No, I'm not the machine, but I do know a little bit about machines, sometimes. This is episode two of the build series, so go back and watch episode one if you wanna know exactly how we got here. But long story shortish, I bought this 1997 12 valve engine many months ago. It was one of those random park deals, but the owner did show me a video of it running on this enormous engine stand. That might've been a fake. The price was great, so I took the bait. Bet you guys didn't know I was a rapper. But in episode one, you'll see we had some trash main bearings. Complete garbage. And some questionable cylinder bores that I made slightly less questionable with a 240 grit flex home. So the crank in the block definitely should have taken a trip to the machine shop, but I think we can get by without that. Probably. You never know what you can get away with in life until you try. So let's pick up, broke my bacon. Let's pick up where we left off. We finished toning, I gave the block a bath, and it's perfectly clean. Enough. Getting ready to throw the crank in. Here's a step you don't want to miss. Put your oil squirter jets in. They go in before your bearings go in, before your crank goes in. If you forget this step, you're starting over. Nothing to it. You need a punch that's bigger than this head, and smaller than that hole. You always wanna clean the bearings before you install them, and I always clean all the oil off of the bearing mating surfaces before I install the bearings. This little tab is not what keeps your bearing from spinning. It's the crush on the bearing and the friction on the outside of the bearing that keeps it from spinning in the block. So my recommendation, remove all the oil from the block and remove all the oil from the bearing. Ooh, that's a thrust bearing. And these are labeled upper and lower. These are the uppers because it's inverted. You always want to clean the bearings. Yes, they should be perfectly clean out of the pack, but they are not. Coffee filter, it's like a paper towel, but it's lint free. Definitely not clean. In case you're wondering, the 12 valve Cummins crankshaft weighs 123 pounds. I suggest using a cherry picker. It's not a one man job. But if you choose to try and pick this up without a cherry picker, you wanna make sure you lift with your back, not your legs, and make sure you twist and bend. If you're gonna be stupid, be really stupid. Pretty sure I've had this bottle of assembly lube for two decades. Almost certain it's no longer good, but I'm gonna use it anyway, cause I don't like to waste stuff. Probably wouldn't be too much hassle with a couple of strong guys, but all I got's me. Well, that could have gone worse. I gotta let you guys in on a little secret. The hackery's about to begin. That crankshaft 100% needs to go to the machine shop. I want you guys to look at the main bearings that came out of this thing. This is the number one bearing, completely trashed. The number four bearing, even worse, completely trashed. Number six bearing, the thrust bearing, trashed. But hey, four out of the seven are good, and that's better than average, so I like the odds. All right, let's all take a look at my crank for a moment. All right, here's the front seal area. Huge groove in it. We're gonna put a speedy sleeve on there. That's not an issue. The rear doesn't really have a groove. It's just got some discoloration. We can take a scotch brite to that, and it'll be fine. Some of the bearing journals, though, number one especially. I mean, you can see that it's not perfect. I can actually feel what you're seeing right now. Number four, also not perfect. And number six, not perfect also. I did polish it a little bit with some 2000 grit sandpaper, which did nothing, but it made me feel better. But I did wash it and get most of the rust off the crank, so it's probably gonna be fine. So yes, in my 20s, I would have taken this crank to the machine shop, but I'm all about learning. And you learn by making mistakes. You gotta step out of your comfort zone if you wanna grow. I feel like we're gonna achieve some growth with this motor. Anybody can make a 700 horsepower 12 valve with perfect machining, parts, and assembly. Nobody's gonna be impressed by that. 700 horsepower hack job, great success. I'm probably gonna take the time to get the rust off of these main caps. Feels like the right thing to do. Key things to remember when putting your caps on. Obviously lube the bearing. You wanna lube the threads and the bottom of the head with some engine oil. Most important thing, don't just sit the cap down on there and uggy dug it down with a torque wrench. These alignment dials need to go in those holes. If you don't get those situated properly with a mallet, before you start running the bolts down, you can break a cap. Ask me how I know. Now we can uggy-duggy. All right, we gotta torque the main caps in four steps. We're gonna start in the middle and work our way out. 
I've got plastic gauge under the journals that had the three worst bearings. I really just did this for science because I'm gonna send it either way. This is one of the worst looking journals, but the plastic gauge is still very uniform in its thickness, so even though it's not the prettiest and it's not polished perfectly, it's still got the right clearance. It'll run just fine, probably. I went ahead and threw a piece of red plastic gauge on there. If you don't know, green plastic gauge is good from one to three thou, and red plastic gauge is good from two to four. And since it was at the upper end of what the green can measure, I went ahead and threw a red on there, but it came out to the same three thousandths of an inch, so that's good to go. There is our main cap number four, same three thousandths of an inch, uniform all the way across. All right, and our last plastic gauge cap. This is cap number six, same three thousandths clearance, very uniform all the way across. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this journal up, oil the bearing, and put it back together. All right, we got a crankshaft installed, torqued down. I gotta tell you, if loose is fast, this thing ought to fly. Must be plenty of bearing clearance there. But before we can flip it over and gap the rings and install the pistons and rods, we need to get all the lifters in there Get the camshaft installed so they won't fall out when we turn it over. Before we can install the camshaft, we've got to put the timing case on. There's the case and the gasket, but according to the interweb, you just use RTV. I've never known the interweb to be wrong, so we're just going to use some uh, ultra gray on there. Everybody has a flavor they like, be it the AC Delco or the Motorcraft. I'm just going to use ultra gray. If it leaks, you can say I told you so. In case you're wondering, that's a killer dowel pin. Mine's still in the block. That's a sissy dowel pin. It doesn't have any killer instincts. It just sits there and exists. All right, so I put a very disgusting bead of ultra gray on there. It looks exactly like something you would expect me to do. There's obviously way too much on there and a lot of it'll squeeze out, but we can just trim that off when we're done. I'd rather have a ton of that squeezed out than have anywhere that doesn't have enough. So we wanna go ahead and install this thing immediately. I wanna make sure you screw that up completely. Don't worry about hitting the dowel pins. Some of my bitch. I took care of that. Not a problem. Probably. That could have been an issue right there at the KDP. We got that. All right, so I fixed that slight misalignment issue by putting even more silicone on there. I can't imagine how that could cause a problem at all. It's probably a smart way to do it right here. Put me some guides on there. There is silicone coming out everywhere. So all we're going for here is finger tight on all our bolts. Then we're gonna let it sit for an hour. And then we'll come back and torque it down to 18 foot pounds. Now in most circumstances, I would never suggest putting way too much silicone on there. But in this one, everywhere the silicone squeezes out can be trimmed after the fact. So it's really not an issue. I just wanna make sure I've got good coverage everywhere. And I'm not just putting in the bolts that go under the cover. I'm actually gonna put some of the longer cover bolts in here to make sure we get a good clamp all the way around. I don't get it. What did I do wrong? It's probably a good idea to make sure you have all the right bolts before you start doing something like this. I certainly did not. All right, let's let those sit for an hour, then we'll come back and torque them down. So while the RTV is drying on the timing case, we need to go ahead and address something with the camshaft that's gotta be taken care of before we put it in. Cam gear retainer. The cam gears are pressed onto the factory camshaft, and that's fine for lower horsepower applications. The crank gear turns the cam gear, and the cam gear turns the pump gear. So when you start turning a lot of RPM and pushing a lot of fuel through your pump, all that extra stress wants to push the cam gear off the front of the cam. That's unfavorable. So there's a couple of ways of going about this. The cheap way would just be to put a few Tig Tacs. Tig Tacs, it's like a Tic Tac and put a few tacks around this junction right here. Of course, that presents its own problems if you ever want to take the gear off the cam. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a bolt-in retainer. All I've gotta do is drill and tap this hole to accept a 7 16 by 14 bolt. Then we'll hit it with some red Loctite and 44 Uggy Duggies, and the gear will never come off. That is a good bit. Drill not so hot. Got my Harbor Freight tap set here. It'll cut threads. Probably. That is not straight. Damn it, I've got it cross-threaded before I've even got threads in it. That is harder than I expected, not gonna lie. I feel like my tap just sucks. I mean, I can't imagine this Harbor Freight set would be of low quality. Maybe I just need to quit being a sissy. Just cut some dang threads like a man. I don't know what 
what that was, but it didn't sound good. Go forward, Jamin. Come on, Drill. Yeah. Come on, Milwaukee. Call me. If I get it one thirty seconds of a turn at a time, we can we can have this threaded by next year. Well, I had to abort the cam tapping mission for the moment. I had to order some new taps. I think the old one was just worn out, so we'll get back on that in a couple of days. So I went ahead and flipped the engine over. I'm gonna go ahead and gap all the rings. I've already cleaned up five of the six pistons, getting them ready for rings. This is number six, so you can see what it looks like. Before it's cleaned, I'm actually cleaning them in some gunk parts cleaner. Does a pretty good job. I spent some time on number one, then I came to my senses and stopped trying to scrub all the black off of them. They'll be black again as soon as that engine fires off. I'll show you guys the cleaning process. Okay, now wait two hours. I'm all about chemistry. I went with total seal rings on this one. The top ring is the conventional keystone ring you're gonna find on pretty much every diesel. And the second ring is your gapless ring. There's probably some eyebrows going up right now, so maybe we should pull out the whiteboard and talk about this for a second. In general, consumer engines are gonna have pistons that have three rings. The top ring is called the compression ring. It keeps most of the pressure in the cylinder and out of the crankcase. The bottom ring is called the oil control ring. It keeps most of the oil in the crankcase and out of the cylinder. The second ring doesn't identify as either, so we call it Pat, Tracy, Joe, Chris, Sam. Pat's job is to stop the small amount of compression that gets past the compression ring while simultaneously scraping the remaining oil off the wall that was missed by the oil ring. Now there's always a little bit of oil on the wall and that provides the seal and the lubrication between the rings and the cylinder wall. Now I told you earlier that Pat, the second ring, is the gapless ring in our ring set. And you might be wondering why it isn't the top ring instead, since the top ring is the compression ring. Well, typically, the top ring is the gapless ring in non-diesel applications, but that's not an option in a diesel due to their unique compression ring design. Most diesels have what is known as a keystone top ring. It's called a keystone because it looks like a keystone. It's one of those cool things that was given to us by the Romans, like daily news and sewers, I think. Let me look that up. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. Keystone sewers and newspaper. That all came from the Romans. I went ahead and drew this second ring the way the gapless ring system works. The main ring is just milled to accept a small rail. Hopefully you can see how this design can't work in this geometry. It's, it's angled. But if you can't see why this design won't work in this geometry, just go ahead and hit the I believe button and move on to the next mystery. So why do diesels need keystone rings? Well, diesels produce a lot of soot and it gets pretty much everywhere in the engine. Soot is why diesel oil turns black and gasoline oil doesn't, usually. Soot will contaminate the ring grooves and cause ring sticking, excess wear, poor performance, and STDs. Keystone rings solve that issue. As the engine cycles up and down, these rings are always moving around in the grooves. Now that radial motion of the ring causes this gap between the ring groove and the ring to constantly get larger and smaller. So this acts like a little bitty rock crusher, constantly breaking up the soot and keeping the ring groove clean. Science. Let's gap some rings. So my ring gap and setup's pretty straightforward. This is my tool for squaring the ring and the bore. You don't have to have one of these. You can simply take a piston with a ring on it and slide it down the bore and let that square up your ring. Once you've got it squared in the bore, standard feeler gauges, file it down with a $30 ring filer, and once you've got it filed, make sure you address the edges of the gap so there's no burrs, and then test fit it again. A lot. Got to sneak up on it. You can't put it back. I've already put the oil rings on. The instructions called for a 15 thousandths minimum gap on the oil control ring, and they were all right there in the ballpark, between 15 and 18 thou. And now we got to move on to gap in the second ring, the gapless ring. And I know that sounds weird, gapping a gapless ring, but the ring's not actually gapless. It has a gap. It's actually two rings stacked on top of each other. They both have a gap. You pay extra for that. So the instructions give gap recommendations for gas alcohol and E85, and at the bottom for nitromethane. We don't list diesel, but since diesel and nitromethane are basically the same thing, we're gonna go with that. So 9,000 times bore diameter. And this is standard bore, so 4.016 inches times 9,000 is like 36,000. So probably just gonna do 35 to keep it a round figure. Look how big my feeder gauges go. Ah, I got a 32. Okay, let's look at a different set. And I'm an idiot. There was a 35 thou right on the other side. They put the fat ones on the outside so the thin ones can stay in the middle and not get bent. Anyway, 
I've got a 35 thou, it's my biggest one, so that's what we're going with. All right, so these gapless rings are a ring and a rail. The rail is very flimsy. So when trying to gap the ring and the rail, you'll find that the ring gaps just fine, but the rail is so flimsy, it really won't sit down in the bore for you to get a good measure on it. So what I did was go ahead and insert all the rings, I gapped all the rings, and then I sat the rails on top of those rings and lined the gaps up. Hopefully you can see that, but the rail is sitting on top of the ring, the gaps are lined up. I was able to measure the gap in the rail that way. All the rails already had plenty of gap in them, but sitting the rail on top of the ring after the ring was gapped turned out to be the easiest way to get an accurate measurement on the rail. Okay, let's go ahead and get these top rings gapped and be done with this. My gapping arm's getting tired. One thing to remember when you're gapping rings, you always want to turn the wheel in towards the center of the ring or towards the piston. Grinding the ring is gonna raise a burr and you want that to turn in, not out. You should be dressing that gap with a stone after you're done anyway, but just for extra precaution, you wanna grind in towards the piston. It's in the instructions. Now all the rings are gapped and I can go ahead and install them on all the pistons. Great fun. The ring goes on first and then the rail goes on second. It seems counterintuitive, but the way these mate together, this has to be in the groove first. I think I've got a tool for this. Use the tool, dummy. Ah. Yep, that's certainly broken. Okay, take two. Just wants to go wherever it wants to go. There's a learning curve. Does this get easier as you go? I am failing miserably at the moment. I promise you I read the instructions. All right, one down and I need a drink. So I finished gapping and deburring all the rings. I got them all installed on the pistons, ready to go in. I got the block flipped over, sorta. I got all the lifters installed and lubed up, so we're ready to put the cam in. The Amazon man sent me a fresh set of 7 16 taps. So I finished tapping that cam gear retainer bolt hole. I'm gonna make sure you use some red Loctite on this. Always need blue Loctite, it's always missing. There's always five tubes of red Loctite just sitting there waiting to never get used. So red Loctite and 44 foot torques. The old cam bearing of bushing was a little beat up so I went ahead and installed a new one. I've got the crank oriented with the timing mark pointed towards the cam. So hopefully everything will just slide right in. Now the important question, does the cam fit between the engine and the camera? Don't want to jinx myself, but this is going in much easier than it came out. Where's my timing mark? Oh, right there. Those zeros, ah, there's zeros over here. Damn it, 180 out, idiot. That hurt. All right, so our cam and crank are timed. We need to get our cam retainer in there and go to bed. Let's just put a little bit of slick em on there. I feel like I should have went ahead and put that in beforehand. Yep. Eject. Why is everything on this motor so damn heavy? <sighs> you drop it first, put some burrs on it, squish your fingers. I'm bleeding. More orange, right in the cover. Smart. What's the torque in spec? Let's Google it. 18 just doesn't seem like enough. I'm not saying it's wrong. It just doesn't seem right. That sounds more better. 22 to 24. So we'll do 25 because Overachiever. And now we go to bed. Wanna make sure you cover your engine with a dirty engine cover. When nobody was looking, I installed a new rear main seal. Plenty of videos on how to do this. Obviously this will be off and on a table. Knock out the old seal, try not to booger up the housing like I did and had the JB weld it. I used a brass punch to knock it out because brass is softer than steel. Problem is, that's made of aluminum. So there may or may not be JV Weld where those marks were. But anyway, after you use JV Weld to fix the mistakes you made, use the install tool that comes with a seal to make sure you get it in there square. Install it square and install it dry and it shouldn't leak. The front seal is gonna be a different animal. It's got a lot of wear groove on it. So we're gonna go ahead and put a repair sleeve on there with a new seal. It's pretty straightforward. It's a very thin sleeve that presses onto the crank. I've seen people knock them on with a rubber mallet. I bought a tool kit off of Amazon for about 20 bucks. So this will actually press the sleeve on using the bolt holes for the harmonic balancer. This is a Molly kit. It consists of a wear sleeve or repair sleeve 
and an oversized seal. You can't use a standard size seal when you're using a repair sleeve, and you can't use an oversized repair sleeve seal when you're not using a repair sleeve. That's why it all comes as a kit. Uh, I've got a light coat of engine oil on here. You might be tempted to put this on with some locking compound, but this is considered a wear item, so it might need to come back off the crank at some point to install a new one. So if you lock it on there, good luck getting it off. One side of the ID is beveled. You should be able to see it there. That's gonna be the side that slides on the crank first. You want to make sure the seal is square before you start cranking down on it. I can tell by the wear on the crank that it needs to come in on the top. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. So just walk it on. A few cranks on each bolt at a time. We're inside the timing case. Let's go ahead and talk about the killer dowel pin. And that's it. All that pin does is index the case on the block so that everything's lined up. But over time, that pin will vibrate out of that hole, fall onto this gear, get wedged between the gear and the case, blow that out, cause an oil leak, or worse, it could actually destroy the entire engine. Hence the name, killer dial pin. Easy fix though. There's a cheap fix and a free fix. All right, free fix, take a piece of flat stock, make it fit in this area, drill a hole in it, and hold it in with this bolt. That will keep the dial pin from coming out. Second option, Get on Amazon or any other diesel website and they'll sell you a piece that does the same thing for anywhere from eight to $38. This is the $8 version. Straight off Amazon to my door for eight, nine bucks. I don't even remember, but for eight bucks, I'm not gonna waste the time with a free option. I feel it's appropriate for me to tell y'all that this is the fourth time I've done this. My mic died on me the first three times. Apparently the battery was dead. I use orange Loctite. You wanna make sure you put all your spare tools and stuff down in the piston bowl so you Forget about them and create another new novel way to destroy an engine. All right, 18 Uggy Duggies. We'll call it 19 because I'm a one upper. All right, killer dowel pin is now a peaceful dowel pin. Let's install some pistons. So let's go ahead and roll some bearings into these and get them in the block. Hmm, damn bearing fell out. <clears throat> I hate this type of rain compressor. Check my bore now. Good enough. Check my rings. Also, probably good enough. Amateur hour. Let's try again. Where'd my rat shit go? Why is it so difficult? What a pain. Come on, ring squeezer. Struggling. What's the problem here? Let's come back to that one. Oh, that's the, that's a dent. Well, all right. That's, that's not right. Did I mention that I hate this style of ring squeezer? I don't understand. It's, it's rings. We're squeezing them. Let's try this hole again. Wrong hole. This is stupid. Should have bought the right ring squeezer. Holy shit, I broke a ring. Broke a damn oil ring. Well, that complicates things a little bit. So what you get for using the wrong ring squeezer? Idiot. That is a schedule setback. Perfect. What's the chances of getting that in tomorrow? Oh, O'Reilly. That's the wrong way. Here's the deal, guys. Don't drink and build. It's just not worth it. You break stuff. And learn from your mistakes. Here's what I can tell you. Using this kind of ring squeezer, that's a mistake. Let's go order another set of rings. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and pull the two out that I just installed to make sure they are not broken. Not ideal, folks. All right, here's number three. And number four, that one's not broken yet. Number six, though, I got my doubts. Ah, there we go. Ugh. Number two, are you broke? Appears not so. All right, it's tomorrow. I had time to sleep on this for a minute. Obviously I got a broken oil ring. Probably not a good idea to JB weld that. Ordered a new ring set from O'Reilly. So that should be there mid morning today. Hopefully that has the right oil ring in it. That's all I need is the oil ring. So I'm gonna go ahead and install all the other pistons except for number two. And then we can do that later when the other rings come in. I don't know that I'll ever use this ring squeezer again. I've never had good luck with it. 
This is what I need to be using, but I don't have one the proper size. This one's about 16th out too small. And this is where I'm at right now. I could easily order one of these, but I don't have three or four days to wait for it to show up. So I'm just gonna have to be a little more gentle and use this one. It occurs to me as I put in these pistons, everybody likes to stress over where their ring gaps are situated. And the instructions will tell you where to situate those rings. So follow the instructions. But I'll also tell you that those rings move on the piston while the engine is running. So it doesn't matter where you put them, they're gonna spin. And at some point, they'll probably all line up for just a little while, and that's okay. So follow the instructions, but no, it also doesn't matter. Probably. This is me not aligning my piston rings. For the price of that one set of rings I had to buy, I could have bought a good tapered ring, ring squeezer. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Here we are. Okay. That's not working. Bingo. Just spraying off the crank journals, cleaning out the bore since they were oiled last night and then allowed to sit and collect dust while I was fuming about my poor motor assembly skills. Ooh, that was a little loose. Ah, heck, they're all loose. Loose is fast. Remember that thing I said about not hitting the crank? Let's hit the crank. It'll probably be okay. Can't see it, so out of sight, out of mind. It's an engine, not a Swiss watch. All right, we have a five cylinder Cummins. Just made it back from the O'Reilly. Got a single set of rings. These are obviously not total seals. They're fell pros, but not a big deal. This is all I wanted, the oil ring. I put the caliper to the broken total seal ring and to the fell pro ring and same thickness. Uh, the width is about two thou difference, but I don't think that's gonna be a problem. So this should work just fine. Let's put it all together. If you've ever wondered why, 12 valve Cummins can make so much torque on a stock bottom end. Here's a factory six liter LS rod compared to a factory 12 valve rod. Mo girthy. Call that a success. Install the piston with all the rings in one piece. Like it should be. Engage. All right. We've got all six slugs installed into the engine. Before I turn it over and torque them, I think we need to talk about something. I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is cylinder number one. And it almost looks like a crack. And it may very well be, but I think it's just corrosion. And I think it'll be okay also. So cylinder one's crapped up. This is cylinder five. Might be hard to tell, but there's definitely a little bit of corrosion or staining or whatever you want to call it. The bores are not perfect. I'm doing this on purpose. Partially because I'm lazy and cheap, and partially because I want you to learn from my mistakes. And if I don't make mistakes, how can you ever learn? So what's the lesson here? Can we make 700 wheel horsepower reliably with a block and a crank that 100% should have gone to the machine shop for service, but didn't? Because the reality of it is, most of these hot rodded 12 valves never get torn down anyway. People are making five, six, 700 wheel horsepower with them without ever looking at the bottom end. I made the mistake opening mine up, so now I know just how bad it is inside. But I'm not gonna fix it, I'm gonna send it for science. All right, we gotta torque these rod bolts. Wow, listen to that. Make sure this is good and oily before we try to silicone it together. What are these? 9 16 Probably metric, I don't get it. 12 millimeter. There is number four and number three. I'm gonna wipe the assembly lube off. Put our plastic gauge on. There is no, no plastic in there. Maybe this is our new one. Where is my dog? Listen, folks, I live in a subdivision and dogs are supposed to be leashed, but I'm all about freedom. So hopefully she doesn't attack anybody. All right, very important here. I know some people are gonna argue this, but the oil clearance is not the same everywhere on the bearing. You're gonna have more clearance at the parting line and the least amount of clearance 90 degrees from the parting line of the bearing. Bearings are not round. They are eccentric. I'll leave a link in the description. If you don't believe me, you can listen to Molly or King bearing, whoever you choose. Bearing caps are bored round. Bearings are not bored round. They are bored eccentric. I promise. I'm all about skepticism. I want you to look it up for yourself. That's why I will provide you a link because I'm all about the facts and bacon. Facts and bacon. 
should probably get a torque wrench for this. Now I want y'all to know I've got bore gauges and I've got micrometers and calipers and all that other crap. But the reality is, plastic gauge is good enough. This is a damn tractor engine, not an F1 engine. Get over yourselves. All right, results. I gotta be honest, I don't know what the spec's supposed to be. So whatever we get, I'm okay with it. Hmm, that is interesting. Yeah, it's just shy of a thou, which is somewhat concerning. Look at the spec on this. I feel like it should be more. For the first time in my life, I've actually thrown plastic gauge on an engine and discovered there's something I need to fix. Sad day. So I went ahead, put the plastic gauge on every rod bearing. And here's what we got. Nine ten thousandths, nine ten thousandths, one and a half thou, two thou, two thou. This one's had its fun and now it's ready to settle down and look for a husband. I'm okay with loose. Loose is fast. I'm not okay with tight. I'm not real sure what's happening here. I mean, this engine's probably got 400,000 miles on it, but maybe these bearings, or at least most of these bearings are a little on the big side, a little on the tight side. So I'm gonna have to order some oversized bearings and mix and match them to try and get the oil clearances that I want. In retrospect, now that I'm gonna buy another 120 or 30 dollars worth of bearings, it might have made sense to just have the crank ground. Ideally, we want between two and three thou of oil clearance on the rods. Here's the basic math. You want to multiply the diameter of the rod bearing journal, which in our case is 2.725-ish, we'll call it two and three quarter. Multiply that times one thou, and that will give you the desired oil clearance for that journal. Obviously, there's a little bit of a fudge factor there, and I'm going to call that plus or minus half a thou. If I get it between two thou and three and a half thou, I'll be happy. Loose is fast, tight's a little dangerous. So in this case, looser is better. So there's only three that are really out of spec. Three, four, and five. All the rest of them are okay-ish. So how do we fix that? Well, obviously taking it to the machine shop is the ideal way to do it, but I ain't got time for that. So here's what we're doing. You can adjust the clearance by using oversized bearings. This is an H bearing. This is an HX bearing. The HX is the same as the H but the HX has one extra thousandth of oil clearance built into the bearing. It's two bearing halves. Each half is five tenths thinner. So when you put them together, you get an extra thou of clearance. It's simple math, but wait, there's more. You can mix and match the H and HX bearings to adjust the oil clearance by only half a thou. That's right. You can mix and match bearings that aren't exactly the same size. Molly says so. So on some journals, I'm only gonna use one half from an X bearing and that'll bump up the oil clearance half a thou. On some others, I'll use a full set and I'll gain a full thou. One thing to keep in mind when doing this, Molly says for rod bearings, you wanna put the thicker shell on the rod side, not the cap side. And on main bearings, you wanna put the thicker shell on the cap side, not the block side. That's easy enough. So when we originally put the engine together, we were using a Molly P bearing. P is the standard bearing. The H bearing is the first bearing in the high performance line that Molly makes. It says high performance right there. They're harder so they can withstand more force. They're coated and they're darker so they obviously run faster. I know that might look a little discolored and defective but that's just the coating process, it's no big deal. I'm sure those non-polished journals on the crankshaft will buff that right out. So let's go ahead and get started with number three and four. This is less than a thou and that's a thou and a half. Both journals could stand to gain at least a thou of clearance so I'm gonna use a full set of X bearings on both of these. I am wearing this plastic gauge out. By the way, ah, oh, this engine has eaten a little bit of plastic gauge. Not gonna lie, sure it'll be fine, probably. By the way, don't waste your time going to a, what the hell? I'm running short on plastic gauge here. I just bought this and I keep dropping it. Don't waste your time going to advanced auto parts to ask for plastic gauge. They have it in stock, but they don't know where to find it. Save yourself some headache and just go to Napa or O'Reilly. If I recall correctly, the torque spec is 30, ow, son of a, 33 foot pounds plus 90 degrees or 44 foot pounds plus 60 degrees or 74 foot pounds, depending on where you look on the interweb. I tried all three torques 
and I got the same oil clearance every time. I got high hopes for this. Hope y'all know. If this doesn't fix it, we might just have to act like we didn't see it. I know a guy that does that. I got faith. If we're at two thou, I'm happy. Or more. Oh. I feel like it got tighter. I can't read millimeters. Ah. Uh, yeah. It's showing a thou, which is what we had before. Actually, less than a thou, which I can't understand because this block's got like three or four hundred thousand miles on it. And I just put an oversized bearing in it. I don't understand. Situation report. It ain't great. Number four, happily at three thou. Number three, mm, about one and a half thou if I round up. I tried three different sets of HX bearings and that's the most clearance I could get on the number three rod bearing. And it's not enough. I know it's not enough. The manual says it's not enough. The, the interweb says it's not enough. And I bet if Gail Banks was here, he'd say it's not enough also. But here's what I do know. The engine ran when I took it apart. And I have all the rod bearings that came out of it. They're all standard. The rods haven't been machined. The crank hasn't been machined. It's all standard common stuff that was put together 20 some odd years ago. We've still got a few others that need to be addressed. Might as well go ahead and start with number five. Also, not nearly enough, so. Uh, let's spin it over and work on number two and number five. Probably gonna take up drinking again later. And the wheels just fell off of this engine build. I don't know if you can hear that or see that. So apparently that 3.2 thou was not accurate. When I did the initial measurement, I measured it with a green plastic gauge, which is good for one to three thou. And it was just a little over three thou. So I, I extrapolated poorly. This go around, I did it with a red plastic gauge, which is two to six thou. And guess what? Measured out a six thou, which is way out of spec. So either A, that crank journal is worn down or B, uh, the big end of that rod is out around or stretched. Neither of those is good. You gotta know when to pull the rip cord. Uh, my half assery does no bounds. It knows my, my half assery only goes so far and this is too far. So as a result of my half assery, I now have to disassemble pretty much everything I've assembled and face my worst nightmare, the machine shop. It's always more expensive than you think it's gonna be. So let's talk about all the things we got to undo now. I got to remove the cam so I can remove the timing case so I can remove the crankshaft. But let's not forget we got to remove the rear main seal also. Then we got to drop all the rods and pistons out and pull the crank. Basically undoing every bit of work I've just done. But hey, at least my rings are gapped. You know, I've always said anything worth doing right is worth doing twice. Okay, I've actually never said that until tonight, but it seems fitting. Anyway. I'm gonna lick my wounds, get this crank and these rods over to the machine shop. Then two months and $1,000 later, we can do this all over again. It is what it is, folks. Sometimes when you roll the dice on used engines, you crap out. I've had plenty of good luck buying used engines on the face space and giving the middle finger to the machine shop, but this time, I gotta pay the piper. I guess I'm about to uh, build back better. <laughs> so thanks for watching. Please hit those like and subscribe buttons and I'll see you next time.